was saying, you're going to take the time to go through an assignment and see exactly how it's supposed to be done. How do we go and answer that question? What do we do? So when I'm looking at this one here, starting off with problem one, write and explain the difference between a minor arc and a major arc. Now, a lot of the times when we're dealing with these things, we, we don't know what something is, we have to make sure that we always go back and double check it. So now, when we're dealing with this, we've got major arcs and minor arcs, do we know what a major arc is? Do you know what the minor arc is? And this would be in your little book if you had actually written it down. So if you need help with it, that's where you got to go. Or you back up in the book. So, but for number one, let's see. Oh, by the way, this would be lesson 27. And of course, my name goes down. Now, there are a lot of you that decide that you cannot go through and that you can't, you know, that you don't do these. So, let's see. Explain the difference between a minor arc and a major arc. Well, let's see. How much, if we've got this in a circle, let's see. The minor arc. Oops, the spell that was helps. See, and this is why it's helpful with a pencil, so when you make an error that you can deal with it. Minor arc would be the smaller part of a circle. Major would be the larger or larger part. Okay. Does that get the idea now? Yes, sir. That's fine if that if that's what it is. But what they're trying to talk about here is that's the definition. Do you understand which one it is? Minor arc is the smaller part of a circle, major is the larger. Your understanding and the exact answers are two different things. I'm looking for the understanding so that you know what they are. Anybody can go and parrot back what a definition is. Do you know what it means? So, number two. Says as a statement, a romp, a square is a rhombus, sometimes always or never true. Well, that would be what? Always. And there are times that you'll just end up writing down an answer like that. So, three. Let's see. Now it says he calculated the area of the given triangle as follows. Is he correct? Now I'm not pulling these back up again. I can always go back and take a look at it. But is he correct? Well, I see that it was area is equal to one half base times height. Correct formula. He took one half times five times six. Is six the correct number to use? And the answer is no. So, did he do this correctly? No. Now, many of you forget the rest of it. It has this wonderful little thing that says, explain. If you do not do the explanation, the problem is wrong because you have not answered what it is asking you to give. So, why? Okay. So, you could say four is the height, not six. Okay. So, you've given the information provided. So now, next one, number four. We are supposed to go through and prove. So, I got four. I need to do a proof on this thing. So, it says given. We are given that M is parallel to N. We have a transversal going through it. And we are supposed to prove that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. So, 
what I would suggest doing whenever you got to deal with this. Okay, we need parallel line, parallel line. Got it going through like this. We've got one, I've got three, and I've got two. That's N, that's M, and that's Q. So now I want to go through and I want to do the proof on this thing. So I've got, uh, let's see, M parallel to N. That's given. So I got to get one and two being congruent. We got a transversal Q on here. What else do I know? Well, could I say that, uh, let's see, could I do this, that angle one is congruent to angle three? Why? What, are, what do we call that when they're on opposite sides of two lines at intersect? <laughs> Vertical angles there. So I could just put down B, A, T. So by the vertical angles theorem, I know that those two are correct. So, the next one, could I say that the measure of angle two is congruent to the measure of angle three? Can I say that? Now mind you, I'm just putting something down here and I'm asking myself a question, can I say that? Do I know that two is congruent to three? And what would be the reason why that, that two is congruent to three? What are they to each other? Corresponding angles. Okay. So I got corresponding angles. So now that I've got one is congruent to three, <coughs> I've got two is congruent to three, can I say that the measure of angle one is congruent, or angle one is congruent to angle two? What's that one? First one goes to the second, second goes to the third, first goes to the third. What will be called it? If you have three things, that's kind of like a triple of something, right? Triple transitivity, yep. So I got transitivity. So, have I provided the information to prove it? Yes. Oh, gosh, no. I could have said that two was congruent to three as my first one, and then went and did one and congruent to three. See, this is the beauty of a proof. A lot of times the order that you put things in does not matter. Granted, there are things that have to come before, but in a problem like this, they can get switched around anywhere that they need to. So, let's take a look at five. Now on five here, it says, let's see, a sprinkler system used for watering, you feel sprayed water into a circular pattern with a radius of 20 feet. The nearest square foot, what area is covered by this? Now, when you are trying to show your work on this thing, we've got a circle. It's at a circular area. Okay, so I'm gonna draw myself out a circle. That, and it said the radius was what? 20. Area is covered by the sprinkler. Well, isn't that just area of a square? And area is equal to pi, 3.14, multiplied by the radius, 20 squared. Now, you'll notice that I did not do any calculation there, did I? I wrote it down. Area is equal to. Grab a calculator. Second plus seven two will reset it. And I've got three point one four times twenty squared and twelve fifty six. Okay. So area is equal to one, two, five, six. What measure we got with this? Feet. Feet square. This is sufficient work to justify doing that problem. Okay? Answers don't cut it. If I take a look at this and read the question, do I have an idea that you know what you're looking at? Yeah. Six. 
We're supposed to clarify if M is the midpoint of AB, write a two column proof to show that AM is equal to one half of AB. Okay. So, now, what is this going to look like? Uh, let's see. It looks like I'm grabbing a sheet here. So I'm going to go six. Well, we're told that M is the midpoint of AB. So if I go and do this, I can write, oh, we'll put it right here. That's A. That's B. That's M. So here we go. M is midpoint of AB. How do I know that? Given, correct? Now, what is the definition of a midpoint? In the middle. Okay. So, how do I go and come up and say then that is the case? What do I got? What do I got to say next? What I need to know something about AM and MB. Well, it would be congruent to. Okay. It is equal to. Oh, we'll go BM just to keep it like that. And how would I know that? definition of midpoint. So I can do that. That seems reasonable. Now let's see. We've got that. But now i got to get this idea that it's half. So if AM is equal to PM, uh, let's see, i got to get some multi i got to get some math going on in here. Can I say that AB is equal to AM plus DM. Would that work? Okay. And that would be what? Segment addition. I'm adding two segments together to get a longer one. That's great. Now, if I go back and I take a look at this, I need to get this thing in terms of AB, AM and AB. And I look at this and I say, you know what? I got AM and BM. Well, AM is the same as BM. Can I do that? Can I say that AB is equal to AM plus AM? Is that legal? Do I have any information that allows me to go and do that? Well, yeah, we said that they were the same up here. So now I've got substitution. Make sense? So when we're doing a proof, we're basically trying to figure out all the bits and pieces to put this together so that we can come up with an answer. So now I'm just going to do some simplification here. Let's see, that would be, again, oh, who, turn it. Simplify. Okay. And can I divide both sides by two? Divide both sides by two? So now I've got the, why do I want to, why do I write an E when I want an I and I when I want so now I got the division prop of equality going on here, right? So, if I rewrite this, do I end up with one half AB is equal to AM? Again, that would be a simple. So, have I proved this? 
Well, I don't have things quite in the exact same you know, order. I could flip that around. That's irrelevant. But have I made a logical argument to say that this is the truth? And the answer is yes. Now, for those of you that love numbering your assignments from 1 to 30, this is the reason why. You cannot do that. You write one problem down, you do it, you complete it. Sometimes you don't have to. Sometimes it's going to take a lot more. So we're up to problem seven. So problem seven. It says, find the coordinates of the midpoints A and B given the following coordinates. Okay. So in order for me to work with this, I am definitely going to have to go and write these things down. So I've got... Oops, back up. A is 1, 8. Or 8, 1, sorry. Let's see. B is 14, 7. C is 7, 11. And D is 5, 5. Now, why in places did I go and write them down? I can just simply look at the book. Part of the reason is when you're going back and forth between your paper and your textbook, whether it's on the computer or in a book itself, you don't always hit in the right spots. Make sure that you have the information down first and then go through and do this. So now we need the coordinates of, we want the midpoint of AB. So for AB, we've got, that would end up being, do we add them together and divide? Isn't that how it goes? 8 plus 14 over 2, comma, 1 plus 7 over 2. So the midpoint for AB, and let's see, 8 plus 4 is 22. You had 8, oh, I said 8 plus 4, didn't I? Yeah, well, it's supposed to be 14, sorry. So we get 22, 22 divided by 2 is 11. We get 8 divided by 2 is 4, okay? And now I am supposed to deal, do, deal with C and D. So for C D, I know that it is going to be 7 plus 5 over 2, 11 plus 5 over 2. So we get the midpoint for C D, and that should be at, oh gee, that goes to 12, so that'd be 6, that would be 16, and that would be 8. Okay? Yes, it requires some work. And for those of you that are, I can figure it out in my head, crowd. Really, I'm glad you can figure this out in your head. If I gave you any more challenging numbers than what was there, you could not do it in your head. The idea is not to come up with the solution, but to learn the process. If you do not learn the process, you will not learn how to do the answer or the problems. So, moving on, we got eight. It says, use the law of syllogism to write a valid conclusion. If all math classes are full, then Raymond must enroll into an elective. If Raymond must enroll into an elective, he will enroll in theater. So, what would be a valid conclusion of this? Well, it seems to me that Raymond uh, let's see, will enroll in theater. That's all I need, right? Uh, let's see. Nine. Got there. It says the seating surface of a stool is a wooden circle with a diameter of 14 inches. So again, I've got a circle, and I've got 14. I know that. To the nearest tents, how much material is used for the top surface of the stool? Area again, right? Area is going to be equal to 3.14 multiplied by 14 squared. Again, you just simply go through and use the calculator on this thing. I don't 
put it out, we end up with 3.14 times 14 squared. Enter. So I end up with six. Area is equal to 615, right? 615.44. Now, am I reading this and doing it correctly? And the answer is going to be no. I would get this problem wrong. Why? Because the instruction said that the seating surface of a stool or the circle with a diameter to the nearest tenth. So that means that I would need 615.4 inches square. Now, again, for those of you that are reading it and trying to do it in your head, it's not going to work so well. Yes. So, I've made a mistake. Right? When I drew this out, I used, I put 14 in as the radius and not as the diameter. So I've made an error. Now, if all I've got is an answer down there, I have no idea what places I did. I can now back up and say, okay, that's wrong. That's not going to be there. And again, the wonderful use of a pencil, I tell you, the qualities of a pencil just really help out, right? <laughs> so that means that the, if this is 14, this is going to be 7 each, right? So that would be 3.14 times 7 squared. So now I can just go back to the calculator again. 3.14 times 7 squared. Enter. And I get 15, 153.86. And when I do it, 153.9 inches squared. There. Now I've got the answer. i got it circled. I know it's yeah. So, moving on to problem 10. If a rectangular table with an area of 36 square feet has a width that is 2 feet less than the length, what are the dimensions of the table? I defy any single one of you in here to try and do this one in your head in a timely fashion. When I say that a picture paints a thousand words, other people have said that. When in doubt, draw it out. Every time that I get something like this that has a figure that has something I should draw out, guess what I do? I draw it out. So, rectangle. So I got an idea of what it is that I'm doing with it. And let's see, area is equal to 35 square feet. Okay, so we know that the area is equal to 35 feet squared. Well, area in this case is length times width, right? So that means that 35 is going to be equal to the length multiplied by the width. Now, if I go through this and read, it says table has a width that is 2 feet less than the length. So if this is the length, that means that the width is over here, right? But it's got to be less than the length, so that means width is equal to L minus 2. So now, I've got the information that I need. 35 is going to be equal to L multiplied by L again. L minus 2. Okay. So, that means that 35 is going to be equal to L squared minus 2L. Now, sometimes when you get down this, it looks like, oh, jeez. I don't know what to do with this. Well, if you knew what to deal with quadratics, you could go and factor this out. But there's even a quicker way of doing this now. Once I see that I got 35, and I know that there's a difference of two, are there two numbers that I can think of that would multiply together to equal 35 that have a difference of two? Yeah, five and seven. Sometimes it is just that easy, but you're not going to know it unless you've got the workout. So if I've got this, we could go 5, whoops, 
I can go five here, seven here, and we know that five times that is going to be it. So, do I know what the answer to my question is going to be? Do I have enough information down there to figure it out? Do I pretty much know how I did this? Yes. This one could be a guess and check. Well, we know that 35 is. Now, with this information written down, doing it in your head, that's possible. But if you went and did it the way it was supposed to be done with being a quadratic, you wouldn't get it. Eleven. So, write a disjunction. It says if Oh, Priya, whatever, I'll go with that. Priya takes the bus, Priya goes to work early. So, does anybody remember what a disjunction is? <laughs> now, it's on lesson what? It's on lesson 20. So if we need to, we end up going back here to lesson 20, which I don't know about the other file. That's here so we'll go through here and I look for a disjunction so I'm looking for that word disjunction do I see it do I see it do I see it do I see it I you could do that too to go through and find it that's always a way of dealing with it. Ah. A compound statement that uses or is called a disjunction. So, I want to write that then with that idea of this, the disjunction in there. I would probably have to write something like this. PR, let's see. Priyanka, let's see. Takes the bus. And then what do I got to put in? Or she goes to work early. There you go. Twelve. So now on 12, we've got it down here that prove that all right angles are congruent. Okay? We are given angle 1 and angle 2 are right angles. Now, can I draw a picture of this against this? Do I even have an idea what this could possibly look like? The answer is not really. So, Let's see. So, angle one, angle two, are right angles, right? Let's see. If I wanted to, I suppose I could do this. R. That's right angles. There we go. What? Irrelevant. Irrelevant. So, this is given. Okay. Now, I got to get this to say that they're congruent, right? What do we know about right angles? Okay. So, angle 1 is equal to 90 degrees, the measure. Wouldn't that be the definition of a right angle? Would the measure of angle 2 be equal to 90 degrees? Definition of a right angle? So, could I say then that the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 2? If I say transitivity? Right? But that 
doesn't answer the question because they want congruent. So angle one is congruent to angle two, and the reason that that would be is the definition of congruence. Because if things are congruent, then their measures are equal. If their measures are equal, then things are congruent. There we go. So, let's see. Come on, problem. Let's see, we got 13 now, right? So, let's see, Adrian. Sometimes these names are kind of weird, aren't they? Oh, sometimes they are. So, A claims that for transversals of two lines, all acute angles generated by the transversals are congruent. And all obtuse angles are congruent. Is she correct? Now, two lines. Okay, can I draw two lines? Now, a lot of times people would go through and do this. They draw this line, they draw that line, and they go through here and say, well, yeah, that's going to, going to work. Because these two lines are what? These are parallel to each other. So if they're parallel, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So that means that, let's see, angle one is going to be congruent to angle four, which is congruent to angle eight, which is congruent to angle five. Yes? And, of course, angle 2 is going to be congruent to angle 3, which is going to be congruent to angle 6, which is going to be congruent to angle 7, right? So, is she correct? And if you said yes and you had this down, you would be wrong. Why? Well, if we go back to what it is supposed to be on this question, it says, let's see, the right one. Yep, so. Claims for all transversals of two lines. Did she say that the lines had to be parallel? Did she identify parallel lines? No. So what would happen if I've got two lines that look like this? So this line goes this way, that line goes this way, and I got a transversal going like that. I don't have them being parallel, do I? So that means that one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, and eight would not work because granted, angle one is congruent to angle four, but because these aren't parallel, I can't say that these angles down here, uh, let's see, I did one and four, right? So that would give me that angle five is congruent to angle eight. While that's true, that pair isn't congruent. So the answer here would simply be no. Why? Lines might not be parallel. Now, my question for you is, if all you're doing is just trying to slap down an answer on a piece of paper and get it turned in, are you actually going to learn anything? And the answer is no, you are not. The object of the game here is for you to go through and learn the material, to understand how to work with it. So now we're up to 14. Road repairs. We got a picture for us. It says a parallel, parallelogram shaped area of parking lot is to be repaved. How many square meters are to be repaved? Again, better picture. Draw it out. Now they have this going down here, and they say that this here is supposed to be five. And they have this right angle down here, and they say that this here is 11. So do I have enough information to go and figure this out? 
area is equal to base times height in this case, correct? So the area is going to be equal to 5 times 11, so the area, oops, yep, area is equal to 55. Now, you're going, well, gee, I could have figured that out in my head. I don't have to write all this down. Yes, you do. What happens if the numbers are not as easy as you have them here? What happens if you have a relationship, you know, like that one we had that length was this and W was two less than the length? How do you go and set that up? If you do not know how to go and set this up just by itself, you are not going to be able to go and work out more complicated problems. So this would be 55 meters squared. So, 15. Okay. We are supposed to prove that, a par that if two lines are parallel to the same line, they are parallel to each other. Okay. So, we had talked about this one yesterday a little bit. So, I got 15. Now, if I look at my picture for this, I have a line... Then I've got a line here, another line here, and another line over here. Okay. They tell us that we've got A, we've got C, and we've got E. This is 1, that's 2, that's 3. And let's see, and this turns out to be T, H, and then I get D, e, D, and Yes, you draw out the pictures. You always draw out the pictures. You are not at the point yet that you can do this math without them. Now, we are told that AB is parallel to CD. We are also told that EF is parallel to CD. What is this? Well, that's all given. Now, it would seem to me that this is drop-dead simple. Why? Because we have AB parallel to CD, which is parallel to EF. So, they're all parallel to each other, correct? And all I did here was, I did a bit of a substitution here if you wanted to. And then I'm just simply going to write it down that AB is parallel to EF. Why? Well, it's parallel because of transitivity. So, I've done 15 problems with explanations in approximately a half hour. Now, you should be able to at least do the math. If you can do the easy problems at home, the ones that you know when you take a look at the assignment, and then you come back here and get help on the problems that you do not understand. And yes, sometimes that's going to mean that you're putting your assignments a little out of order. That might mean that you're going to have to have two pages that go with it. doesn't matter. Do the problems that you can write it out, show your work, otherwise I cannot help you. Now, this is my expectation for how your assignments are to be done. So from this point forward, you write them out from 1 to 30 and give me answers, you are going to be getting the assignment back. Is this understood? 